in this difficult and bizarre time of COVID-19 that the whole world is uh, living through at this time, it's easy to see how our actions impact on somebody else's life. So as I share my childhood experiences with you, notice the times that someone has taken an action, whether a good one or a bad one, that has impacted on somebody's life. You see, I believe that each of us has the power to make a difference for good in the world. And I hope that by the time um, I'm finished, you too will believe it. So let me give you an example. Because of one very evil person, and I'm not even going to mention his name. I think we all know who I'm talking about. Because of this evil person, more than 14 million innocent civilians lost their lives in Nazi Germany's killing machine. Six million of them were Jews murdered by the Nazis. Although it wasn't just Jews who were persecuted by the Nazis, Catholics, communists, the Romas and the Sintis, which is actually the proper name for people who are more often known as gypsies, which is not a nice way to call them. Homosexuals, Jehovah Witnesses, the mentally and physically challenged psychiatric patients, as well as others, were also among the victims. However, only the Jews were singled out, targeted for extermination, as if we were cockroaches. There was no way out for a Jew. It's the first time in history that you could not save yourself by converting to another religion. If one grandparent was Jewish, you were doomed. Of the six million Jews who were murdered, one and a half million were children. Only 11% of Jewish children survived the Holocaust. I'm going to read off three names of children who were murdered. One of them is my uncle, Aaron Gelbwax, Jacqueline Morgenstern, Leah Kligman. I've timed myself, and that takes me 15 seconds to pronounce those three names. If every day for eight hours nonstop, I read off the names of the one and a half million children who were murdered, it would take me 290 days. So why do I do this? I do it because it's hard to comprehend these kinds of numbers. They become meaningless. And yet it's terribly important for us to understand that each one was a unique human being with a face, with a name, with hopes, with dreams, with talents, that were simply wiped out. So how do we put flesh and bone and heart and soul into each of these numbers? Well, you've probably read a book. Maybe you've read um, The Diary of Anne Frank or Elie Wiesel's Night. 
And maybe you've seen a movie about the Holocaust, like Schindler's List. And maybe you've been able to go to the museum, the Holocaust Museum in Washington, or the Museum of Jewish Heritage in New York. And right in our own community at Brookdale, in, uh, at the Center for Holocaust, Human Rights, and Genocide Education, there is a wonderful exhibit of three genocides, the Armenian, Rwanda, and the Holocaust. So these are some of the ways that we can begin to put a face, a name on some of the victims. But while the opportunity still exists, and it is getting more and more difficult as survivors are dying off, and you are actually the last of the students who will have this opportunity. But while the possibility still exists, we meet with a survivor and we listen to what they witnessed and what they experienced. And because I am one of the fortunate 11% who survived the Holocaust, I consider it my sacred obligation to share my story with you. So mine is not a horror story. I was not in a concentration camp. I don't have a number tattooed on my arm. But I did witness some terrible things. And there were times when I was very frightened, sad, and hungry. My story is about the courage, the compassion, and the morality of some good people who saved my life, who have enabled me to live with optimism, and whose example inspires me, as I hope it will inspire you to emulate those qualities. These are my parents, born and raised in Wadowice, Poland, a medium-sized town about the size of Asbury Park or Red Bank, um, about an hour from Krakow, which was once the capital of Poland and not far from the notorious death camp, Auschwitz. If any of you are Catholic, you will be particularly interested to know that Pope John Paul II was born and raised in Badovice. And I have three uncles, twin brothers, and on my father's side, and a brother on my an uncle, rather, on my mother's side, who were the same age as the Pope, were in the same class as the Pope, and have spoken very, very highly about the good, decent person that he was. So my father, Aaron, was one of 11 children. His mother, Judith, died giving birth to her second set of twins. This is his father, Shraga. And I want to read to you from this memorial book that survivors from our hometown have written about my grandfather. Here's a picture. They write that Shraga was good-hearted and dedicated to the poor. In spite of his own poverty, he gave the poor milk on credit and waited patiently long periods for payment. He remained a widower, laden with 11 children. Nevertheless, he took into his home three orphans from the Weiss family. The Nazis forced him to dig a grave with his bare hands, and then they shot and killed him. My mother, Sarah, 
was the oldest of five children. And these are her parents, David and Rachel, or Renya in Polish. They were well-educated, middle-class, and very religious. Both of my parents were active in the Zionist movement and had planned on moving to Palestine, as Israel was called in those days. There was no state of Israel at that time. Unfortunately, they were trapped before they could fulfill their dreams. But my father had two sisters, Chava and Naomi, who had already gone to Palestine. And they were able to take photographs and there were some times when mail went through because this was before the Nazis invaded Poland. And it's important for my story, for later on in the story. So when my parents married, they moved to a slightly larger town called Bielsko. My sister Helenka was born there. My father was involved with the Communist Party. Now, I know that nowadays communism is almost a dirty word, but I want you to keep in mind that in its early days, it was an idealistic movement, albeit, I think, a failed experiment. My father was a very friendly and outgoing person. He had many friends, both Jews and non-Jews. When the Nazis invaded Poland in 1939, my parents went back to Wadowice and moved in with my mother's parents. And this is my grandparents' home. This picture was taken a short time after communism. So where you see the sign, that was not part of their home. I think you can see that it was a rather substantial, beautiful home. So at first, the conditions were terribly frightening, but somehow tolerable. Yes, the Nazis confiscated Jewish businesses. They froze their bank accounts. They fired Jews from all forms of employment. They forced Jews to sew a Jewish star on their outer clothing, which they had to wear at all times. And although everyone had to carry identification cards, on the Jewish identification cards, you suddenly got a new middle name. So if you were a male, your middle name became Israel. And if you were a female, your middle name was Sarah. So that they were always identifiable. And yes, they forced my father and my uncles to work as slaves digging ditches. But somehow they managed. So it was around this time that my parents tried to change their fate. My mother and father, with my father's two older brothers, Isaac and Jacob, uh, the youngest one, Aaron, is among the one and a half children who were murdered. I read his name off to you earlier. So here at least you can put a face and a name on one of the one and a half million children who were murdered. So as I was saying, my mother and father with my mother's two older, oldest brothers snuck out in the middle of the night. It was dangerous because there were curfews and they walked a great distance to reach the Sand River, which divided what was Nazi-occupied Poland from Russian-occupied Poland. On two consecutive nights, they tried to cross the river, only to be shot at from the Russian side. 
Ultimately, my mother decided that she could not try it again. Helenka was less than a year old. She was wet, cold, and crying. But they persuaded my two uncles to um, stay and try on their own. Maybe they would have better luck. And in fact, my two uncles succeeded in crossing the river and survived the war in Russia. That was no picnic either, but that's a whole other story. My parents went back to Vadovitsa, where my mother organized a class teaching women how to sew. It was believed that if you had a skill, a talent that was of value to the Nazis, that your life would be spared. And sewing is certainly an important skill. Everybody needs clothes, soldiers need uniforms. So weeks went by with no word from my uncles. Everyone was worried about them. Had they succeeded in crossing the river? How are they living? What was their emotional state? The mail was slow and it was censored, but eventually a letter did arrive. And I want to read you my grandmother's letter uh, responding to theirs. And I hope that you can appreciate what it means for me to hear my grandmother's voice in this, these letters and to have a sense of the kind of person that she was. So my grandmother writes, my dear, lovely children, I have received your letter. The news from you shook me to my depth, but we are believers and I trust and believe and my heart tells me that we all will overcome everything. And when again, we will get together, we will tell each other the stories. Therefore, please, I ask you, my dear children, do not worry about it. Don't take it to your heart, but be as you are now, brave and strong, and God will definitely keep you under his care and will not abandon you. Do not worry about us. We are not worse off than others. For the winter, we have again the same two barrels of sauerkraut as last year, potatoes and beans. Heshek, who is a cousin of theirs, and your friends were taken to Gornihak. That was a forced labor camp. One time I plead with you, be brave and all bad things will pass. I kiss you, Renya. So now it's November 12th, 1940, and my mother gives birth to her second daughter. They name her Ruja, which is Rose in English. And I think you probably can guess who that might be. That's me. Little by little, things got harder and harder. The Nazis forced the Jews out of their homes, moved them into a small area of the town, closed it off with barbed wire. The ghetto got more and more crowded as Jews from nearby villages were forced to move into smaller and smaller quarters, which they had to share with other families. So at this point, it was my mother and father, my sister and me, my grandparents, my aunt, my uncle, and a great uncle. Nine people sharing two rooms and a kitchen. For two more years, conditions kept getting worse. There were more and more roundups and deportations to forced labor camps and concentration camps. People died from disease and starvation. And then in August of 1943, the Vadovitsa ghetto was liquidated. It was a moment of terrible panic and fear People were scrambling to hide in every conceivable and inconceivable place. 
And in this moment of terrible panic, my mother had to make a very difficult decision. She had to decide, would she keep her two small children with her and accompany her frightened elderly parents to almost certain death? Or should she abandon her parents and try to hide with her husband and the two little ones? And her third choice was to remain with her parents while her husband takes the two little ones into hiding. I don't know what went into my mother's decision, but my mother accompanied her parents, her sister and brother to Auschwitz, where they were murdered in the gas chambers. Meanwhile, my father had prepared a hiding place in the rafters of a nearby attic. And there we hid all night long in the sweltering heat of an August attic, covering our mouths so that no sound would escape and give us away. When my father thought that it was safe, we crawled out of our hiding place into the deserted streets of our ghost town. My father carried me in his arms and Helenka on his back and walked a great distance back to Bielsko. I mentioned earlier that my father was involved with the Communist Party. It was one of his comrades that my father now sought out. She was a Christian woman, an innkeeper, and my father's friend. And this Chasida Umot HaOlam, a righteous woman among the nations. And I regret that I don't know her name. But she took us in and was willing to hide us. We stayed with her for a short time while she and my father tried to figure out what to do next because communists were also being persecuted. And because my father had lived in Bielsko and people knew him, knew that he was a Jew, they decided that we had a better chance of survival if we could cross over to Czechoslovakia and meet up with a larger cell of their comrades. And so we boarded a train. And I imagine that Helenka and I probably sat with the innkeeper and that my father probably sat alone in order not to endanger us. The train was stopped by a Nazi convoy and as fate would have it, one of the people in the convoy was from Vadovica and he recognized my father and pointed him out. There, there's a Jew. They took my father off the train. They shot and they killed him. The innkeeper took us back to her home and continued to hide us. There were times when the Nazis would come searching for us because some Nazi sympathizer had reported his suspicion that the innkeeper was hiding Jews. At those times, we were rushed down to the cold cellar placed in large wooden barrels, I think covered up with some kind of cloth or something, and covered with poppy seeds. My first very vivid memory is being curled up in the bottom of this barrel. I was less than three years old, so I was small. I'm curled up in the bottom of the barrel, my heart is pounding and my throat closing up with fear. I can hardly breathe for the fear. As the Nazis are poking their rifle into the barrel. This happened on several occasions and ultimately, um, the innkeeper realized 
that it was only a question of time before we would be discovered. And so she asked two sisters who had come selling eggs and milk from their nearby farm, nearby village of Buczkowice, if they would take us in. And these two women, Julia and Anna, also righteous among the nations, they had large families of their own, and they passed us off as nieces from a bombed out village. Halenka lived with Anna, and I lived with Julia. But we saw each other every day as she tended goats. I took that picture a couple of years ago in Poland, and I took care of geese. I remember one time having to go to church only one time. And I was terribly, terribly frightened because I knew that as a Jew, I'm not allowed to kneel and cross myself. But I also knew that if I didn't, they would know that I was Jewish and I would be killed. I tormented, what should I do? What should I do? Ultimately, I kneeled and crossed myself and I prayed that God would understand and he would forgive me. I also remember that only on a couple of occasions, the, some soldiers would come to the farm. And at those times, the family did not want to take any chances. And so they hid me. And when I met the family, they actually showed me how they would move the bed, remove the floorboards. I would climb into the space between the subfloor and the floor. And of course, the boards and the bed would be put back into place. We lived on the farm until the war was over. And then one day, my sister Helenka was taken from her family by a Jewish organization and brought to Ludz, which was a city quite a distance away. She kept crying for her sister, and the people in this Jewish organization thought that she had become attached to the Christian children on the farm. And they kept reassuring her that's, those aren't your real sisters, don't worry, you'll have a new family, everything's going to be all right. But she would not be appeased, and she kept insisting, no, you don't understand, I want my sister, I want my sister, until they decided to go back and to check, and that's when they found me. I have such a vivid memory of getting off the train spotting my sister across the platform, running into each other's arms and holding on to each other for dear life. You see, we knew that we needed each other to give each other strength and courage. So this place in Ludge was kind of a, a camp-like setting, and it was established by survivors who were searching and rescuing hidden children. One of the leaders in this um, place in Ludge must have reminded my sister of our father, and so she clung to him. His name is Yechiel Granitstein. And he felt sorry for us because we were among the youngest of the children who had survived. And so he sort of adopted us. We called him Fetter. Well, after several weeks, maybe a month or two, we were secreted out of Poland and smuggled into Prague, Czechoslovakia, where we lived in the DP camp, a displaced persons camp. 
uh, we weren't in this place very long, um, probably no more than a month, but from there we were put on buses and sent to France where we were placed in orphanages. I'm sorry, this is another picture of Julia. Uh, it was taken many years later, and I believe that's a grandchild of hers. And here is a picture of uh, Julia's home where I was taking care of geese. And this is the first picture that I have of Helenka and me. I'm the one with the white rabbit coat and the pointed hat. And my sister is to the right of me in the other white rabbit coat. Those coats were given to us by our fetter, Yechiel Granitstein. And this is a very important picture, actually, for later on in my story. So are you puzzled about um, secreted out and smuggled in? I want to explain something to you. You see, we were refugees. And just like today, no country wanted to take in the refugees. And so in order for us to be able to start a new life in a country that didn't represent where our families had been slaughtered, in order for us to be able to start a new life, we had no choice but to become, in today's jargon, illegal immigrants. I want you to think about that. So, as I said, we are now living in France. Um, we lived in France for about four years. They kept moving us from one orphanage to another. I'm not sure why they did that. I know in one case the building was terribly dilapidated, and in another case um, the original owner of this home uh, came and reclaimed it. But we were in about five different orphanages. And here's a picture of, uh, I'm the one in the middle, and that's Javi and Piazinka. We were the three youngest in the orphanage in Fublen. That was the second orphanage we were in. And this is a picture of Helenka and me in the last orphanage that we are in. I want you to notice um, Helenka and I are all the way to the right. Uh, I want you to notice, first of all, how, and, and this was pointed out to me actually by students. Um, I had not noticed it until they pointed it out, how Helenka and I are holding hands. We are always, always taking care of one another. And notice also the swollen belly, which I think is quite pronounced in uh, my sister's photo. A swollen belly is an indication of starvation, malnutrition. I remember one time crying my heart out because Helenka had contracted tuberculosis and was sent to a sanatorium, a hospital. Um, it was very scary for me not to have my sister with me. Well, after many months, her health improved and um, she returned back to the orphanage. 
While we were in the orphanage, an American couple by the name of Eleanor and Sam Banker came for a visit with the idea of adopting a child who had survived the Holocaust. Helenka and I were malnourished, our teeth were rotten, our hands and feet were swollen and cracked from frostbites because you see that last orphanage was in the French Alps. It was very cold and snowy and we didn't have warm gloves and boots to protect us from the cold. Nevertheless, the bankers decided that they would take a chance and adopt us. They hired our fetter, Yechiel Granitstein, um, to arrange all the necessary documentation for us to be able to come to America. This was not easy to do. It took many, many months. And uh, during this time, this is the document, by the way. Um, so during this time, we lived with Yechiel, his wife Malka, and their little boy Shmuley in Paris. Oh, before I get to that, um, so these are the first dolls that we received from Eleanor and Sam. We are still at this point in the orphanage. And here's a picture of uh, Helenka and me after we've had our teeth pulled, our haircuts, new clothes. Uh, so here we are in Paris. And here you have a picture of Yechiel Granitstein, his wife Malka, and their little boy Shmuley, and a picture of Helenka and me in Paris with Shmuley. Finally, it's now August 30th, 1949. Helenka and I board an airplane with our future adopted mother, Eleanor Banker. And we arrive at Idlewild Airport, which is now Kennedy, on September the 1st. After what felt like a long car ride, we arrive at our beautiful new home in Interlaken, New Jersey. There's our home. The table was set for a festive meal. Our new aunts, uncles, and cousins were there to welcome us. But Helenka and I didn't last long at the dinner table. Exhausted from our journey, we were shown to our separate bedrooms and put to sleep. Whoa, hold on there. What were they thinking? Separate bedrooms? Helenka and I had never slept alone, and it did not take me long to crawl out of my bed and crawl into bed with my sister. Well, a few days later, we stood on the corner of our block and waited for the school bus to take us to our first day of school. We didn't speak a word of English, and I had never been to school. So I think you can imagine how I was feeling. By now we'd been given new American names. So Helenka became Helen and Luta, which is how I was called, became Ruth. Not knowing how old we were, our parents arbitrarily gave us new birthdays. They guessed that I was around seven and a half and that Helenka was, sorry, Helen by now, was nine. Try to imagine what it feels like not to know how old you are. Who were your parents? What were their names? What happened to them? Helen and I lived with these questions until we were well into our 20s when something miraculous happened, and I will share that with you in just a few minutes. 
But first, I want to share with you what we did know. So we knew that terrible things were happening to the Jews. We knew that we were Jewish and that we would be killed if anybody found out. We were pretty sure that our parents had been killed, but there was always this nagging hope that maybe somehow they had survived, they would come back and find us. And we knew that we had only each other, that we had to stay together and take care of one another. So now for this miraculous event, it's a long story and I can't go into the, all the details, but in 1962, 13 years after we came to America, our uncle Isaac, one of the two who had crossed the river and survived in Russia, he was now living in Israel and he was desperately searching for us. And because of that photo that I showed you of us standing in front of the bus in Prague, that picture appeared in a book in uh, Israel called My 100 Children. And from that picture, my uncle was able to trace us and he finally found us. This was a turning point, a major turning point in our lives. Let me first show you. Here's a picture of my uncle Isaac and his wife, Hannah. So this was a major turning point in our lives. We found out that not only did we have this one uncle, but we had eight more aunts and uncles and many, many cousins living in Israel. Our family gave us photos of our parents and our grandparents. Uh, they gave us letters that uh, my mother and my grandmother had sent to them while they were in Russia. And they shared all that they knew about our family and what had happened to them during those terrible times. And that's how I've been able to put together many of the pieces of what happened to us during those times. But there have been other miracles, what, what I call little miracles. And another one happened in 1984, when thanks to my Aunt Matilda's efforts, I reconnected with Julia's children. Unfortunately, Julia was no longer alive, but three of her children, Vatislava, that's me in the blue dress, Maria and Stanislav, they were older than me, they remembered me, and they filled in more details about what happened during the time that I lived with them. So I immediately, upon a returning home, applied to Yad Vashem, which is Israel's Holocaust Memorial Museum, to have Julia recognized as a righteous among the nations. 20 years after my first application, my efforts finally came to fruition. And this summer will be nine years since my husband, my three children, my niece, and from Israel, three cousins and a friend accompanied me on a very emotional voyage back to Poland for the ceremony uh, honoring Julia as a righteous. Uh, I have, these are some pictures from that ceremony. That's Halinka is uh, Julia's granddaughter. Unfortunately, by this point, uh, her children were no longer alive. So her granddaughter received the honor on her behalf, and that's her in the black and white striped shirt with her husband, her children, and grandchildren. 
Uh, I love this picture, the man with the big mustache, the gray suit, and the woman sitting next to him also in the gray dress. They are, they have been recognized as righteous among the nations. Uh, you can see he's proudly wearing his pin, she also, but it's harder to see hers. There were a few more in the back, uh, also recognized righteous. And the next day, uh, we went to Butchkovica, and that's my family and Halenka's family. My cousin Igor stops me to say a prayer of thanks in front of um, Julia's home where my life was saved. This is Anna's home where my sister Halenka was living, taking care of her geese. And here we are at the cemetery, lighting candles and saying prayers. I want to read you um, part of a speech that I gave at the ceremony. I said that Julia's courage not only saved my life, it has shaped me and enabled me to live with optimism because I was blessed to experience goodness even in that time of horror. I look around me today and I see Julia's grandchildren and great-grandchildren who might not have been born had she been caught. And I see my children who would not have been born had she not taken me in. How many souls are not here and how much poorer are we all because there weren't more Julia's. We have a responsibility to perpetuate the legacy that Julia has left us, that each of us has the power and the obligation to make a difference in the world. So there you have it. That's my story. But please understand that I didn't share my story with you so that you would feel sorry for me. All of us have had or will have traumas in our lives. We all have stories to tell. I certainly would not have chosen to have had to live through those difficult years, but you know what? No one asked me, and so there I was. Now I had a decision to make. I had, now I had a choice to make. How am I going to live my life going forward? You too have choices to make as you go through your life. So here are some lessons that I hope you will take away from what I have shared. They might help you make better choices. At least I hope so. The first is that each of us has the power to choose what we make of our life experiences. By that I mean we can see ourselves as helpless victims, become withdrawn, bitter, angry, even hard and cruel, or we can see ourselves as survivors and celebrate our strength and our resilience. Use them to become involved, caring, empathetic, loving people. You have that choice. The second lesson that I hope you will take away is the corrosive, destructive force of hatred. Ultimately, the hater suffers a lot more than the one who's being hated. Uh, there's an old Chinese proverb that I think says it best. 
Hatred corrodes the vessel that contains it. And the third lesson that I hope you'll take away is that we need to guard against bigotry, intolerance, extremism, and to recognize the humanity in each of us. Now, I know that, thank God, most of us are never faced with these life-threatening situations requiring of us this degree of courage. But in our day-to-day -day lives, we are at times confronted with situations that offer us the opportunity to do the right thing. Yes, I know, it often feels as though what I do is, or what we do, has little impact. It's almost insignificant. So let me reassure you that even the smallest act of kindness, relieving a child's fear, even for an hour, or a man's hunger, if only for a day, or restoring dignity to a fallen person just for one moment, or standing next to someone who's being bullied, it really is very significant. It means a lot. To the downtrodden, just one moment of relief can change an entire life. And who knows, who knows what great discoveries or accomplishments this one life can achieve. And even if nothing great, every life has value. It's in fact precious, deserves to be treated with respect and with love, and is worth saving. So, in the beginning, I spoke about the devastation that one evil person wrought. But you know what? He didn't succeed in his um, goal. Our sages teach us that he who saves one life saves the world. And here is my small world my family. I thank you so much for staying with me and um, for, I hope that you could take in what I've shared with you and um, I thank you very much.